Hello, my name is Ryan Tipsharani, and I'll be speaking about COVIDcast, which is uh, a digital ecosystem for COVID-19 tracking and forecasting that I've been working on for the last year with the Delphi Group at Carnegie Mellon University. Just wanted to quickly point out that if you'd like to see an interactive version of this talk, where you see all the code that was used to produce all the figures, then you can click on this link, which is hung off of um, the COVIDcast GitHub. So I figured I'd start off by telling you a bit about the Delphi Group, um, both pre and, and during the pandemic. So the Delphi Group formed in 2012. It was uh, founded by Roni Rosenfeld, who's a professor in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon U University, and myself, to develop the theory and practice of epidemic forecasting. We, uh, every year since then, participated in the annual CDC flu forecasting challenges, and we've earned top, uh, top marks in terms of forecasting accuracy for many of the years between 2013 and 2019. And in 2019, we were awarded um, one of two national centers of excellence for flu forecasting by the CDC, so which solidified our, our relationship with them. In March of 2020, um, our group pivoted to focus on the US COVID-19 response, uh, and we pretty much dropped thinking about seasonal influenza. Um, the, the thing we've been working on for the last, let's say, year has really been the full pipeline. But we've been focused more than ever on data, which is going to be the kind of central focus of this talk as well. So I want to give you a broad view of the indicators that Delphi has been building and putting into a database that we call, um, I mean, the whole project is called COVIDcast, but at the center of this project is the COVIDcast indicator database. And so the way I like to think about it is to think about what's called the severity pyramid, which is a breakdown for, it's a categorization for different data sources in terms of what aspects of an epidemic or pandemic they're reflecting. So the very top of the severity pyramid are deaths, Let's say, let's speak about this in the context of COVID-19. This will be deaths that are reportedly due to COVID-19. And at the very bottom are population level behaviors that are relevant to tracking or understanding the pandemic. For example, like mobility patterns, whether people are wearing masks, et cetera. And then there are many rungs in between. So I'll just kind of quickly mention them and, and then quickly point out what may be some relevant data sources uh, in order to understand what's happening at that rung. So deaths at the top, um, in the pandemic, deaths are actually officially tracked through public health reporting, and they've been available um, for the entirety of the pandemic pretty much through uh, aggregators like uh, Johns Hopkins University's CSSE group. Below deaths are critical hospitalizations and below that are hospitalizations. So for most of the pandemic, we did not have reliable, a reliable source of hospitalization data um, that was you know, reportedly due to COVID. Uh, but you can find such data um, you can find traces of such information in medical insurance claims, which could be extremely relevant, um, but are not typically publicly available. Below that are, are what you might call ascertained um, cases. So these would be confirmed cases of COVID. And this was along with deaths, uh, you know, one of the two uh, major focuses of public health reporting. So this was also available um, through aggregators like JHU CSSC group. Below that are outpatient visits. So these are people who'd be visiting the doctor potentially pre-confirmed um, COVID, but would, would be visiting the doctor with, with uh, symptoms. And again, this would be something that's not typically publicly available, but that could be, um, you know, you could track it through medical insurance claims. Below that are symptomatic individuals in the population um, who, you know, again, maybe they may be symptomatic, but not attending the doctor's office and, and not getting COVID tests. Um, and below that would be all infected individuals, whether symptomatic and asymptomatic, and below that, like I mentioned originally, are, are relevant population level behaviors. So the bottom three rungs, symptomatic, infected, and population, they're very, very hard to kind of infer rigorously about what's happening at those rungs um, through common publicly available sources. But um, there are sources of information that could be extremely useful for learning about them. For example, like surveys. You can ask people whether they're experiencing symptoms. You can ask people whether or not they're going to large public gatherings, whether they're wearing masks at those types of gatherings. You can um, see on, on aggregate what kind of uh, ser searches people are, or search terms people are, are searching for on Google, whether they relate to um, you know, sim symptoms of COVID or potentially even rare symptoms, 
et cetera. So on this severity pyramid, I've drawn in bullet points on the right um, concrete data sources that would reflect what's happening at those rungs. And I've color coded them in two colors. Blue are things that are publicly available. Uh, and red are the data sources that are only available um, through Delphi's efforts. So they you would not be able to find them anywhere else than in the COVID cast database. So there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to try to give you a slightly different view of, of what we do in this COVID cast project. And this is a this is trying to give some evidence to why I'm using the word ecosystem, which is an ambitious word. Um, you know, I think that it's probably you know, it's probably not an ecosystem in some technical sense, but I like to think of it that way. And here's my explanation. So at the very bottom of the project, at the kind of bottom floor of the project, is what I like to think of as the data floor. And here's where we get um, a bunch of unique data coming in to the COVID counts project, supported by partnerships with um, entities in tech and healthcare. And so I've just listed five down here. There are many others, um, but some of these are partners in which through which we run surveys. Some of these are partners through which we receive aggregated medical claims information. Um, and some of the, for example, Qu Quidel is a manufacturer of COVID antigen tests. So you can see all sorts of different um, sources of data coming in. And then up one level above that is the database itself. So what we do is that we uh, process and create signals from these data, these data sources so that each signal, we also call that an indicator, uh, is you know as close to real time as possible, as, as ge geographically detailed as the data permits, um, and it reflects an aspect of the pandemic. It basically reflects one of those uh, rungs in the severity pyramid that I showed you on the slide before. We also include in this database all co common public or many pu common public sources of data on COVID. For example, confirmed uh, cases and deaths as made available through GHU CSSE group. And importantly, this is an aspect I'll return to a bit later, we record all revisions of the data, not just the most recent values, but the, the entire historical footprint of the data, even when the source does not. So when, when the data provider or the data source does not, we will still internally make copies you know, of all the data values that it took historically, which is an extremely important point for um, trying to understand uh, and, and track a pandemic, as I'll return to later. One level up from that is the API and some software that we've written um, supporting the API that supports basically easy data fetching, processing, plotting, et cetera. Uh, this is all publicly and freely available through our GitHubs. And one level on top of that is perhaps the most user-facing work, but in two very different sides. Um, on the left of the schematic is our kind of um, interactive maps and graphics side of the project, which supports point and click visualizations and data fetching. And on the right is our most technical work, which is using these indicators um, to, to, to boost now casting, forecasting, and hotspot detection models. So I certainly can't talk about everything. Um, I'm going to just focus on the API, and I'm going to give some data, uh, some demos of the data. And I'll emphasize again that everything that I show is reproducible. If you visit the GitHub version of this talk, then all the code is contained in it. Um, so I'm going to walk through those demos, and then I will try to conclude with some lessons learned from the past year. So this is the outline, um, just basically according to that. Demos, and then, and then lessons learned. So um, here's the uh, beginning. Um, now to describe the API. So the API is based on standard um, HTTP GET queries, and it returns data in either JSON or CSV format. And the specification you know, structure for getting data is very simple. Um, it's basically just what you see in front of you on the slide, so that we, we require um, you to specify the data source. So that could be, for example, um, you know, surveys that we run through Facebook. It could be claims data that's coming from Change Healthcare. It could be um, you know, antigen tests coming from Quidel. It could be symptom searches coming from Google. Or it could be you know, cases or, or death data coming from JHU, CSSE's GitHub. So there's just a bunch of data sources you can select from. Within each data source, we compute many signals. So you can specify the specific signal that you like from that data source. Um, and then you specify whether you want daily or weekly resolution for the time. 
um, whether you want county, uh, metro area, state, or national level data for the spatial resolution, uh, and over what range of time and over what range of geographies you're looking for. And there's some links at the bottom. Um, there's a link to the API documentation, and then we, this is a link to our, our visual dashboard that displays a lot of the indicators. So um, in addition to the API itself, we've also written R and Python packages that support uh, easy API access. So I'll just kind of give a very, uh, very brief overview. So they, they basically support easy API querying because a lot of the parameters are set to sensible defaults. So they're trying to guess sensible defaults depending on the partial information you provide. They provide so full support for data revisions. And then they support um, all sorts of um, signal or statistical processing tasks uh, and, and plotting as well. And in, in the right-hand side, of bottom right of this uh, slide is, is a link to the R and Python GitHubs. And I'd like to you know, encourage folks, if they're interested in seeing something new or even contributing something new, to submit a pull request. This is all, everything that we do, which I think I've maybe not said explicitly, but I've hinted at, everything we do to the full extent we can, we make open source. Um, and so we would love it to be, you know, community effort even beyond our group. Here's a, a list of the indicators as of uh, basically today when I when I um, compiled this slide. Um, I think there are, if I'm not mistaken, I think there are around 70 indicators that we have currently uh, in the API. Uh, this might be a bit too small to read. Um, you can find the, the full set of indicators on the API documentation, um, but you can see that they come from a variety of data sources. Okay, so now I'm gonna walk through some quick examples. Um, these are really just meant to be demos, as I said, uh, and each one comes with code, um, very simple code to produce this plot and to fetch the data. So basically the code shows you everything you need to go from nothing to this, to this plot. Um, and I'll just show the code for the first one and for the for the rest. Like I said, you can visit the reproducible version of this talk on our GitHub link at the start of, at the start of this presentation. Um, and one last note, um, I'm recording this uh, talk in early May. Um, so as of the as of the air date of this talk, there'll be you know another month of data available. So that's why it looks like uh, the data on all of the the slides that you see in this talk only goes up until till early May. So let's suppose you're interested in knowing how many deaths um, have been reportedly due to COVID-19 in my state. So I live in Pennsylvania um, every day since the start of the pandemic. So that would be um, very simple. If you, if you were an R, this is R code, you would just download the COVID cast package, you would install it, and then you would um, issue um, a query to the API through this COVID cast signal function. You'd specify the data source. Here, um, you know, we're looking at uh, USA Facts, which is another aggregator um, like JSSU of, of the public health um, reporting streams, cases and deaths. I specify the signal. So here I'm looking at death incidence numbers. Incidence means the number of new deaths per day. And there's also a bit of smoothing happening here. It's a seven day moving average. And I'm specifying that I want data between March 1st and um, basically April 28th here. I want data at the state level and just for Pennsylvania. So that's that's all it is. It's as simple as that. Uh, and then at one one uh, basically call to plot on that returns data frame, and you get you get that that plot. So we can see that the first wave in Pennsylvania um, was pretty substantial, and then the second wave that hit you know a lot of the south in the summer was didn't really do anything in Pennsylvania, but the third wave um, that happened over the winter was very substantial. And deaths have come down a lot since then and appear to be, at, you know, at this point, maybe slightly picking up again, although it's hard to tell. Okay, um, I'm going to whip through these the rest of the examples somewhat quickly because I wanted to have uh, a good amount of time on the lessons learned. So probably give a little bit less detail through these examples than I did on the first. But let's suppose you're interested in knowing how many daily hospital emissions um, are due to COVID-19 in both my state, Pennsylvania, but then comparing to other states, Pennsylvania and, uh, excuse me, New York and Texas. So it'd be a similar call to, to the API through COVID cast signal. Um, this is actually showing hospitalization data that we um, make available in our, in our COVID cast API based on medical insurance claims that are aggregated and de-identified. Um, and so this would not be 
uh, found in, in you know, a traditional public data source. And so this would be, like I said, unique to the COVID-CAST API. And we can see that the dynamics of, uh, you know, at least hospitalization dynamics over the course of the pandemic have been quite different in some ways for these three states. So the first wave, uh, it was, you know, much more substantial in New York uh, and in Pennsylvania. And then in the second wave, it was, you know, very notable in Texas, but not so much in, in the other two states. And then in the third wave, all three kind of moved together. And now again, it looks like uh, at least Pennsylvania has picked back up um, towards the, the end of this time horizon. Moving down the severity pyramid, so I don't know if you notice I've done that, I've gone through deaths and hospitalizations and now to cases. Um, you might be interested in knowing what is the current cumulative COVID-19 case rate look like nationwide, so county per county. So this would be um, the total number of reported COVID cases over the entirety of the pandemic uh, and because it's a rate, it's, it's normalized by population size. So you can think of this as the number of cases per 100,000 people. That's the common units in epidemiology is per 100,000. So um, this, this picture is a choropleth map that's also easily supported in our, in our R package. Um, and in Python, everything would have been analogous. Uh, and darker red means a higher um, cumulative case rate. And the darkest red here, I think, is about 12.5%. Um, so that's the percentage of the population. That it's, that's, uh, you know, basically 12,500 reported, cumulative reported cases of COVID per 100,000 people over the course of the pandemic. And so the fact that there's quite a bit of dark red in this picture is, it's actually quite a remarkable um, fact that, um, you know, over 12% of the population has, has reported a positive COVID test um, over the course of the pandemic. Moving along um, to now down to uh, doctor's visits, down from the kind of confirmed cases or ascertained cases wrong to outpatient visits. So this is um, similarly computed based on medical claims, uh, de-identified and aggregated, um, and similarly not found as, we, as far as we can tell in any existing public data source. Um, and now I'm comparing various cities. So in each of these examples, I've just chosen kind of geographies um, somewhat arbitrarily to give you a different mix of, of uh, you know, kind of the, the flavor of the example. Um, but in all of these data sources, just to repeat, we make things available at the finest geographic resolution possible, which is typically the county level for, for these data sources. So here I'm competing, uh, comparing a, a variety of, um, or actually four different major metropolitan statistical areas or just kind of informally cities in terms of the fraction of doctor visits that were due to COVID-like illness. So this is based on, a, on symptoms, essentially. Uh, and you can see that, again, there's, there's quite a bit of different dynamics in the, between the first and the second waves. Uh, and then in the, in the third wave, you know, there's a huge spike and, and basically all of the cities. And it's come back down and it's actually, it appears to have been somewhat stable across the last month or so. And uh, I think this is maybe the last or maybe the close to the last example. This is, these are uh, the next three examples actually are all based on the massive surveys that, that Delphi is running in coordination with, with Facebook. So here is an example comparing um, symptoms that are being reported through the survey. And so we actually ask people to report on uh, whether they know people of people in their local community who have COVID symptoms. So it's kind of an interesting indicator that's based on what we call uh, proxy information, having somebody not report on themselves, but about what they see around them. Uh, and I'm comparing my county, which is Allegheny County, which, with a friend of mine's county, which is Fulton County uh, in, in Georgia. And you can see um, quite a different pattern in the, in the early days. And then they, they peak at somewhat different times in the third wave, but they both, um, you know, they both extend to a pretty high number. Over 30% of people in each county report that they know somebody with COVID symptoms uh, at their peak in the third wave. And here are some, the, the last two examples are actually based on behavior uh, information that's also uh, computed through this massive survey. So now we ask people to self-report how frequently they wear masks in public through the survey. And I'm comparing six states, DC, Massachusetts, New York, uh, then Idaho, South Dakota, and Wyoming. 
And we can see a really big difference of, uh, I would say, of course, um, I mean, there's many reasons for this. This is perhaps not surprising just anecdotally. Um, you know, these three are also quite rural. And so people will be, uh, you know, they won't be around other people or perhaps being in public means something different. So there's that confounder, but even apart from that, um, you know, there's maybe anecdotal reason to believe this difference is not so surprising. And um, we can see that actually these three states have all increased in, in self-reported mask use um, all the way up through, you know, basically to January and then have, looks like they've started to decrease since then. Whereas these, these three states have been pretty consistently high um, throughout the course of the pandemic. And uh, lastly, um, I'm looking at um, two plots on vaccines. This is again, uh, data computed through our, our massive survey. So in, on the left-hand plot is the number of people who have, uh, who are self-reportedly received a single COVID vaccine. Um, I will note that it, it looks like our uh, estimates for the percentage of people who have been vaccinated based on self-reporting is quite high compared to um, reports made available through the CDC or other channels. And we think that's perhaps because we're not able to adjust, um, we're not able to adjust basically this, the data from the survey based on all of the rest relevant um, demographics. We're able to adjust based on some demographics, but we don't have enough demographics to adjust it perfectly. And perhaps that leads to an overestimate of self-reported, um, you know, how many people have actually taken the vaccine. Um, but it, it's nonetheless very encouraging to see like basically all of these states moving together um, quite dramatically. Um, these are the same six states that I showed you with respect to the mask plot. And here is a, on the right, the number of uh, people who, a percentage of people who would be willing to accept the COVID-19 vac vaccine if they haven't yet. Uh, and they display different trends. Um, you know, some of these decreasing more quickly than others. And in DC, you can notice that the, the data actually kind of halts in early April. That's because at that point, um, we didn't have enough responses on the survey in order to create faithful estimates because most people in DC who are taking the survey at least have been vaccinated and therefore will not be responding to this question because this question only asks those who have not been vaccinated. Okay, so those are just a bunch of examples um, of what kind of data we make available. And uh, now I'm gonna talk quickly about revisions. So um, by default, the, the API calls return the most recent available data, but you can also ask for access to any previous versions of the data through other optional parameters, which you can find on that slide. Um, instead of going into the details as to why you would need it in general, I thought I would show you an example. That's probably um, you know, just as good a way to get it across. So here I'm showing you um, doctor's visits the percentage of doctor visits that are due to COVID-like illness uh, in California for a period of time um, that stretches up to September 1st. And let's suppose that you're interested in using this data in order to make a forecast for you know, COVID cases in the days and weeks to come. Well, um, if you were to pull that data as of the end of September and go back and, and you know, do some retrospective uh, training and evaluation of your forecasting model, then this is what you would have seen for the, the doctor's visit signal. But that's not relevant for, you know, let's say evaluating forecasts earnestly. What is relevant is what it would have looked like as of the forecast date, which in this case was, you know, the hypothetical date of September 1st. And there we can see that it looks very different and that's due to revisions. Um, and in fact, you know, after, basically after the first version of this indicator that we compute, more medical claims get, um, you know, entered into the system uh, later and they actually affect this indicator in quite non-trivial ways. So what we can see here is that the denominator, um, which is the, the total number of visits actually uh, receives data, um, more late data essentially proportionally speaking to the numerator, which is the percentage of doctor visits with COVID-like illness. And so the entire indicator gets brought down. And if you were to query the API at intermediate uh, time points, um, you would have seen different things. So this is just to emphasize that, uh, you know, rigorous tracking of revisions is extremely important for situational awareness, um, now casting, forecasting, you know, any kind of uh, real-time uh, activity uh, surrounding the pandemic. 
And so we provide uh, full revision support accordingly because it's so important. A real quick, uh, just, I mean, I guess, high level look at our survey, and then I'm gonna go on to lessons learned. Um, the survey covers a bunch of things. You saw several indicators. It has many, many others. Um, and this survey is, is massive. It actually receives about 50,000 responses per day and over has received over 20 million since the pandemic began in April. Um, if you want access to the raw response data, so individual survey responses, which are de-identified, um, then you can fill out a data use agreement and uh, receive access if you work at a university or a nonprofit. Um, and, and otherwise, you and anybody can receive the aggregate data that's available on our API. So there are links there um, for you to explore. So now I'm going to move on to lessons learned. Um, I'll have to do this somewhat quickly because I see I'm approaching time. So I wanted to break it down into three areas, um, forecasting, now casting, and what I'll call risk taking. And this, these are my lessons learned as they all relate to statistical modeling and machine learning, broadly speaking. Not lessons learned in some, um, you know, maybe broader public health sense, but that relate to stats and ML. So first on forecasting, the lessons, lesson learned here is actually somewhat obvious. Uh, it's that forecasting in a pandemic is a very hard endeavor. Um, and, you know, apart from being individual, um, an individual group working on forecasting, our group has actually been working to support the COVID-19 Forecast Hub, which is uh, a project run by the other center, CDC Center of Excellence for Forecasting um, at the University of Massachusetts. And so our group and uh, the UMass group, led by Nick Reich, um, we, we advise and work with the CDC on forecasting. And through this hub, um, a bunch of citizen scientists submit uh, basically forecasts to the CDC that serve as the basis for the CDC's official communications on COVID-19 forecasting. And so it's really not an easy problem for maybe all the reasons that you would, um, you know, perhaps, perhaps identify in hindsight. The SNR is, is generally quite low. Uh, there's quite a large degree of non-stationarity and data problems are a constant struggle due to things like delays, revisions, anomalies, uh, et cetera. And so all of these problems, they don't only exist in the task of building individual forecasts, they also propagate over to the task of building an ensemble model uh, that itself serves as the basis for the official, CDC's official communications, which is what our group and the right group work on. So it's just a very hard problem in general. Um, I would recommend that you check out this paper from uh, Nick Reich's group, which does a comprehensive analysis of all the forecasts submitted thus far, but the takeaway is only a small handful of models thus far can actually consistently outperform the baseline, which is a very, very um, kind of trivial forecaster. So the lessons learned are, are that, uh, you know, simple, robust models, either mechanistic or statistical, really have tended to be performed the best so far, and robustness here is the key. Um, uh, perhaps, a, a, you know, being self-critical, we as a community missed every surge, so there was really nobody that... Um, you know, let's say consistently predicted the first, second, and third waves as as occurring in the locations that they actually did. Uh, and it's not clear that we passed what I would call the eyeball test. If you if you looked at our forecast and compared them to uh, visually to common sense, it's not clear that we would would have been doing anything that you couldn't have done with your eyeball. So that's a very uh, important but self critical point. And one extremely important lesson, which I think is clear to all of us now, is that a continual and direct engagement with the end users of forecasts is critical. It's not really clear what people are looking for um, and whether you have the right abstraction. And so continual engagement will help refine the abstractions and make the forecasts more useful. Um, the next lesson has to do with now casting. So now casting is an emerging candidate for um, what I would call MVP, most valuable problem um, in that sur surrounds statistical machine learning in COVID-19. Now casting is a different problem than forecasting. In some sense, it's a more basic or more, or more fundamental problem. Uh, the problem is to estimate the final value of a signal that will only be observed at a later date, um, but is kind of currently or partially observed, and that will this will this uh, the level of noise or the level of completeness will progressively improve as time passes. So claims data are a perfect example of this because claims are submitted late and backfilled for weeks and months. And only months later do you actually know something definitive about medical claims. Um, and 
For COVID-19, it's even more complicated. Essentially, what happens is that um, the, to the, to the delays in the public health reporting system, every case that we get, uh, that we, we observe through public health reporting channels is typically on median six days old and can stretch up to 40 days old. So actually all of the case instance data that, that we are believing to be current is actually delayed through, it's through the inherent delays in the public health reporting system. And it's an even harder problem than this claims data because of um, a convolutional aspect that I don't have time to describe. But now casting is extremely important. Um, here's just a kind of a quick schematic of it. Uh, for two reasons, really. It's one is that it's it's really an open problem compared to forecasting and deserves um, you know much more attention from the modeling community. And it's technically quite underdeveloped compared to forecasting. And two is that uh, a good answer to now casting could actually redefine the ground truth that's used for forecasting. So it would influence everything that comes downstream. And I, I wanted to point out that, you know, while time scales may change, while reporting delays may, may shorten, it's not gonna, now casting won't go away as kind of a fundamental problem in public health. So it deserves to be solved properly. And the last one, um, just to say it very quickly, is about taking risks. So at the start of the pandemic, we saw um, just this wealth of kind of smart people jumping into working on COVID forecasting, um, the community of modelers, citizen scientists surrounding the CDC has grown tremendously from the days uh, pre-pandemic to the days during the pandemic. It's, it's uh, the, those working on, for example, flu forecasting, there was only a small number of groups compared to the number working on COVID forecasting now. So we felt that it was really um, probably uh, would lead to a greater impact if we pulled away from forecasting and started working on data itself which has been our focus for the majority of the pandemic. This is not a risk that we could have taken if we didn't see um, you know, all of the support that uh, basically manifested in terms of the citizen science community. Um, and it can be hard to quantify the value of good data. This is something that we'll be trying to do for many years, not just us, but you know, basically everybody who cares about um, you know, quantitative computational modeling is asking the same question. Um, that said, we're starting to see in retrospect some very encouraging results that these indicators can provide in problems like forecasting and now casting. So it looks like, at least in this case, it was potentially uh, true that this risk paid off. So that's all I had. I'm sorry I went a few minutes over, and I wanted to thank you for listening to the talk.